excellent testimony that you just gave us. Now, as you heard in the beginning, we have Pigeonhole. So Pigeonhole is a, is a new program that we're trying to use. So people have been sending questions. So the questions come onto my phone, and then we can read them out to facilitate it. If you have any other questions, um, you, you can send them now, and then we won't get through all of them. There seems to be a common theme amongst most of them. And then afterwards, we'll have our reception in the house, and you're most welcome to, get, to continue the discussion with Dr. Orwood. Now, so we'll start off. Now, one of the questions is this, and I, I think you've you touched upon it on most of the questions. Now, what are some of the practical ways, this is from Denise, what are some of the practical ways to reach those who are hostile towards theism, and especially Christianity? Oh, that's a great question. Um, welcome to what I do for my job. <laughs> um, I think one of the most important things we can do is first try to find out why are people hostile. We have to start with understanding because people have very different reasons for being hostile. So for instance, um, the problem of evil is one of the most significant objections to, um, to theism and indeed to Christianity. But people come at that problem from very different angles. Now there are some excellent um, intellectual defenses of, of um, you know, the free will defense, you know, that God is allowing us to make decisions that matter. You know, we can't love him if we're not free to love, etc. There are some really great intellectual defenses um, of Christianity against the problem of evil. But these arguments will seem not only useless, but cruel and heartless if the reason the person is asking is that their best friend just got killed in a car accident or their little sister <coughs> just been diagnosed with terminal leukemia. We have to find out where people are coming from. Um, if people are hostile to, to the idea of God because they're hurting, the very first thing we must do is what St. Paul tells us, weep with those who weep. That's the very first thing. Until we do that, our words are wasted. Um, once we do that, then I think the next thing is to point to Christ on the cross. Because that, he, is the problem, the solution to the problem of evil. It is, it is his love that is that answer. And if people have questions about, well, how does that work? Then we can talk about that. Then we can address the intellectual problem. But every problem has emotional components and spiritual components and has, and has, has experiential components. And we've got to find out which is the, is the main issue. And I think that is something that we, we skip over so quickly. Because honestly, if you've got a good answer to any given problem, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas, five arguments for the existence of God. They're wonderful philosophical arguments. I teach them in one of my classes. Um, but we can't just take this as if it's a six-shooter, bam, cosmological argument. <laughs> it just doesn't work that way. You know, it just doesn't. Um, and so, so part of the answer to that question involves where are people coming from, but the other one, I will attempt to brief, I've written basically an entire book about this, it's my book, Apologetics and the Christian Imagination. We have to think about what do the words mean? Because if to our interlocutor, the word God means angry old man in the sky who will blast you if you say a bad word, you know, St. Thomas Aquinas isn't really gonna reach him um, because we're not talking about the same God. We're talking about the ground of all being and he's talking about an imaginary superhero. So we've gotta be in the same, same level of meaning and that's why probably the most significant question that we can ask is, what do you mean by that? Okay, you don't believe in God. Don't start into your why you should believe in God. Say, oh, you don't believe in God. Well, what do you mean by God? And find out what they mean. <laughs> and then you might have a chance of having a useful conversation. Is there a difference in the way that you would evangelize an atheist as opposed to a non-Catholic Christian or a person of other faith tradition? So I'm paraphrasing from Agnes. Well, first of all, I really do want to uh, emphasize um, it's a very, 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 very different thing to evangelize a non-believer or someone who, who is not a Christian um, versus encouraging a fellow Christian to come home into the church. They're two different things. 
Um, and it's really important that we stress that because we can really be very hurtful to our brothers and sisters who have a deep love of the Lord Jesus, a devout faith, a love of the Word of God, a, a, a deep walk with the Lord. Um, for our brothers and sisters who are Christians in other traditions, no matter, even if they, even if they have really mistaken ideas about the Catholic Church and, and sometimes they have really you know, hostile attitudes, they're Christians, they're our brothers and sisters. What we want to do is to say, we love you. We love the Lord Jesus too. And there's so much more. We have such a closer relationship with the Lord than you can even imagine. We want to share. We want, you're, you're like camping in the backyard. We want you to come into the house and, and you know, have a good meal. <laughs> That's what it's like to evangelize our brothers and sisters who are Christians. We say, we are gonna see you in heaven. Um, but let's, let's get into the fullness of the faith now um, so that you can enjoy that, that union now. Now with people who don't recognize our Lord Jesus, then there's a whole different setup and we have to, we again have to find out where are they coming from. And there is no single approach. There just isn't. Um, people are coming from a Muslim background, have different ideas, different objections, people coming from a Hindu background, from a Buddhist background, um, from a totally non-theist background to people who are raised, you know, you know, really fundamentalist atheist. You've got to find out where they're coming from. Um, so there really, again, there is no short answer. Um, you've got to find out what are their questions? What are their assumptions? That's the tricky bit. What do they think they know about our faith? Because almost always they think they know something that isn't true or that isn't complete. Um, so for all of my Protestant friends out there who might be watching this video, no, we Catholics do not worship Mary. We really don't. We really don't. Um, so we can talk about what we mean by venerating her, but we don't worship her. So that kind of thing. Um, but we have, to, we have to find out where people are coming from. Um, and it's really important that we be willing to, to acknowledge if we don't have the answers. Um, one of the most powerful things that anybody can say if you're faced with a question is, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Say, you know, your Muslim friend really puts you a poser about the Trinity. Please, don't BS it. Just don't, okay? Um, or your hardcore atheist friend, you know, takes a pot shot at, you know, the reliability of the scriptures and you don't have a clue. Don't, don't waffle, don't fake it. Just say, you know what, I don't know. Now, it's even better if you can say, but I'll try and find out and I'll give you some resources about the answer. Yes. <laughs> That's the best. But at least say, I don't know, because then you're establishing, first of all, you respect them, that you're not trying to you know, BS them and pull the wool over their eyes. And then when they ask you a question and you do have an answer, what do you know? They'll believe you because they know that if you don't know, you'll say so, right? So again, just find out where people are coming from. And again, very different people who believe things contrary to the faith versus people who are brothers and sisters in Christ and we just want to invite them to share in the, in the fullness of it. This app is too good because we're getting all these questions. Now, here's, another, here's a question from Tom A. Who are the modern Chesterton, Lewis, and Tolkien? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, there's a lot... There's some, there's some great figures. I would say Bishop Robert Barron um, is a really great apologist, and I am very privileged to be a member of the Word of Fire Institute um, and to have a little tiny, tiny part in that great, in that great endeavor. I think Bishop Barron is a real model. Um, I think he is a, a Lewis Chesterton for, for our time, really, in the way that he is just an amazingly intelligent and knowledgeable, but also very gracious and winsome and funny, and he genuinely likes atheists. He sees them as, what do you know, human beings that he wants you know, to come into the faith. And I think his model also of engaging with new media um, and using it in, in effective ways, um, not like pandering to lowest common denominator stuff, but using it, you know, using video, using YouTube, um, things like that, I think is really, is really good. So I think Bishop Barron um, would be somebody I would hold up there as a figure, um, as one of those examples. Now, the interesting thing about someone like you know, Lewis or, or Tolkien or, or Chesterton is, is those are also literary figures. Um, and it's, 
when if you if you say, well, who are the who are the, the literary equivalents of that? My answer would frankly be that there really aren't that many people who I would put in that category. Um, we've got too many who are copycats and not enough who are doing good new work. Now, one one person I would um, put in that category um, is a actually an Anglican poet, Malcolm Geit, G U I T E. Um, and I've, I've got him actually, I've got a poem, poem by him in my apologetics book. Um, he's an Anglican poet who's really doing marvelous work writing accessible poetry that really brings people into the, into the um, Christian faith. Um, he has a written a, um, a sequence of uh, Stations of the Cross sonnets um, that I, I read devotionally um, for, as my Good Friday devotions. They're really powerful. They're in a book called Sounding the Seasons. Um, so he, I think, is an example of the kind of work, uh, sort of Chestertonian, Lewisian, mere Christian kind of work, engaging the imagination. Um, and his work has been very influential on, on my own um, in terms of imaginative apologetics. So he would be an example I would give of um, the more literary side. So I say Bishop Barron, um, Malcolm Geitz, and we need more. We need more. So maybe some of you will be the next ones. You know, in 20 years' time, please give me more people that I can, that I can mention because I want you all to be doing that sort of thing. <laughs> I have time for two more questions because the crudity are getting cold. So, that was a bad joke. <laughs> all right. Crudite are raw vegetables. So anyways, so the next question is from Liam, one of our PhD students. So how do you balance the use of C.S. Lewis and Catholic apologetics with his Anglican points on a view on various things, example, the soul. It's a long, it's a good question, it's a long one, if there's one particular thing. Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, and it's, it's important too, because C.S. Lewis is such an important figure. He's just so tremendous, his intellect is so powerful, um, that it's, it's almost with fear and trepidation that I disagree with him in anything. But he never became a Catholic, so he's, he is mistaken in his ecclesiology. Um, and I think, just recognizing whenever we're working with a non-Christian, I think we first just have to identify, well, what's the area that we're working in? Um, and, and are there any points at which we have to differ? And if there aren't, you know, maybe, maybe there aren't. Like for instance, in Malcolm Gwynne's poetry, very rarely are there any points that are specifically, you know, dogmatic. It's, it's usually the fundamentals of the Christian faith that the issue doesn't really come up. Um, and so that we had to first ask when we're working with a non with a with a non-Catholic writer, um, okay, do we do we even need to raise this as an issue? Um, and then if we do, I think we just need to say, okay, well, I respectfully disagree, and try to see the ways in which that disagreement might influence other conclusions that we draw um, from that. I think one of the reasons that Lewis is such a, a great figure, I mean, a tremendous figure. Um, is that although he never became a Catholic, um, he really did try to stick to the fundamental elements of the Christian faith, and he did a pretty good job of it. So we can really make use of, of what he wrote um, very effectively. And then we just have to recognize when we differ. So for instance, the, the point I think that's most significant with Lewis has to do with his very famous illustration of um, Christianity as, um, mere Christianity as a hallway with different rooms opening off of it, and the rooms are different, you know, Methodism and Catholicism and in the Church of England and the Baptists, and they're all different rooms. You enter into the hallway, and then you eventually have to pick a room, all within this big house, which is just generally Christianity. And it's an extremely appealing, a really, really appealing picture, because it's basically like, well, let's just all get along. Um, and we're in different rooms and we've got the different furniture, you, you pick the one you like and it's all good. And it can be sometimes difficult for non-Catholics to realize that we're not arguing that the Catholic room is better than the other rooms. We, we, don't, we don't accept the metaphor. Um, Chesterton has a version of it, which is the Catholic one. He gives the metaphor of walking along and seeing little chapels here and little chapels there, and then he looks up and he realizes that all of them are within one edifice, and that edifice is the church. There is no hallway. It is all the Catholic church. Um, and 
so I think it might be Numa, though I can't quite remember offhand. Um, basically, when we talk about our separated brethren, we mean that the Catholic Church is the house where there's the meals and the fires and the comfortable beds and all that. And our brothers and sisters who are Protestants are, are in little pup tents out in the yard. You know, they're in the territory, but they're, they're kind of cold and chilly and, you know, at best they've got these little lean-tos up against the, the house and they're like looking in through the window and we're like, come, come in the front door, please. You know, please, the door's open, you know, come in. So the problem is that we don't accept the ecclesiology. Um, and C.S. Lewis, in his picture of the mere Christian hallway and the little doors that open off, offer it, he's offering a Protestant ecclesiology. And that's perfectly natural and perfectly good because he was a Protestant. Yeah. Um, but that ecclesiology, you know, as a Catholic, we recognize that's, that's not what we believe. It's, it's not the way the church is. The church is the whole thing. There are no separate rooms. Um, now, I teach at a Baptist university. Um, I teach amongst Protestants. And I think that the mere Christian idea is very, very powerful as a sort of strategy. Um, I think it's important that we recognize that it's, it's helpful to say we're going to focus on the things that we hold in common. Um, we're going to agree that we do disagree, and we're not going to say they're not important, but we're going to focus on things that we have in common. I'm very grateful to be able to work in this environment. Um, it's a great environment to work in, um, and I respect my, my Protestant colleagues very much. Um, but I think we have to keep in mind that we're it's a, the whole idea of mere Christianity is, is a strategy, it's, it's not a thing. Um, and I, I think it's especially important, I'm, I'm dwelling on this a little bit, because there are a lot of people who, who like the idea of mere Christianity so much that they want to just be mere Christians. They say, I don't want to have any denominational ties. I just want to love Jesus. You know, I'm just going to read the Word of God, and I'm just going to love Jesus, and I'm just going to be a mere Christian. But there, there's no such thing. We've got to make commitments, um, and either we're inside the church or we're not. Um, we're in the big, we're in the big building, or we're out in the yard. Better to be in the yard than out in the wilderness, definitely. Um, but I think we, we just we can't gloss over the differences. We have to we have to recognize that they're that they're there and that they mean something. Okay, so there are many good questions here. We can't get through all of them this evening. So what I would recommend is again can speak to Holly in the house, and there's, there's I'll give you an example, there's about, what are the best arguments to, to defend the faith? What are the, the natural arguments that point to, to that? Um, one other question here, what, what I wanted to end off is from Krishna. So he asked many questions, and one of them is, that, would you say that even if one finds intellectual satisfaction with Christian philosophy apologetics, that reading authors that engage with the imaginative faculty is necessary, and why? So that, that can be the last question. That's a great question, and I would say, short answer, yes. Um, God gave us our imagination and our reason, and our imagination helps us to make things be meaningful. We can know things with our mind, but if we only know them in our heads, it's, it can sometimes be difficult to get them into the rest of our body, in a sense, get them into our emotions, get them into our wills, get them into our habits? Um, do we just know things, or do we really live them out? And I'm particularly emphatic on this because I'm an intellectual. I know this temptation, the temptation to just know things about God rather than know God. Um, it's a constant temptation in my line of work. <laughs> um, and so, it's, so the imagination is always at work in all of us. Um, this is a whole other lecture that I might give here someday. Um, but we need to be cultivating our imagination, we need to be feeding it, because we can't turn it off. If we don't feed our imagination in meaningful ways, if we don't train it up it, to go the right way, to support our faith and to support our goodness and to go towards God, then it will turn in on itself. It will be perverted, it will be stunted, it will, it, will, it will hurt us. We can't turn it off. We're not robots, and that's a good thing. Um, so I think that it's very important to engage that dimension of our being, um, and that's a little different for each person. Now, I love literature. Um, that's a really big thing for me, but you don't have to love literature to have your imagination be nourished. 
Um, this chapel is a great example of, of beauty, nourishing faith. Um, everything in here, the proportion, the design, the architecture, all says something about who God is as the beautiful as well as the good and the true. That kind of thing um, can be a part of your imaginative dimension. Have a prayer corner with icons. Um, use you know prayer cards that, that depict the saints that, that are beautiful. We've got some beautiful icons up here. That sort of thing can really help us. It's, it's no coincidence that the early Christians, as soon as they could get out of the, well, actually in the catacombs they did paintings. <laughs> Art has been part of the Christian experience from the beginning because we need to, de we need to develop that imaginative um, capacity. Um, music also, um, so that these are all things, these are not extras, folks, these are not extras. These are part of how we can flourish as Christians. Um, and I just wanna, what I wanna end on is just the note of integration. Um, we, need, we need to cultivate our intellects we need to cultivate our emotions to be rightly ordered towards God. We need to cultivate our imagination so that we find that what we're believing is meaningful. And it all needs to be lived out in a life of personal holiness. The church is, is, is wounded right now, um, but the church is always wounded, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, and what we are called to do is to be saints. Every one of us is called to be a saint. So are we trying to do that? Are we trying to help each other to holiness? That's what we should be doing. Um, cultivating personal holiness in ourselves, in those whom we love, in those whom we meet, um, and then as our whole selves, body, mind, soul, will, emotions, imagination, the whole thing, all of that, orienting it towards God. Um, that's, what we're, that's what we're called to do. So that's what I commend to all of you. Thank you.